mentioned to UPMDA, but and it's actually something that's still used. And it's uh, uh, basically the idea is that you don't have to have this equidistance from the road. You have some uh, have a conver conversion factor instead. So it's, it's a very similar idea, and then they, they, they do the whole thing like a different the start actually, which we call it star topology, or so there are some, some different tricks. So let's let's just go through this in the same way. It's exactly the same distance as we had last time. See if I can get it right now. And then you calculate what you call this R values or transformed R values, which is basically. Uh, uh, something that, that you have a new distance that it depends on the different evolution rates in R1 and Rb in the two different R is the, the, the branches. So you have first you take I guess um, so uh, there are these two formulas that is write down here level one and level two that are uh, calculated so you have this basic product Say R A and R B is basically the, the, the total distance from or the, from uh, each other between in this case uh, A to all the others and B to all the others and C to all the others and B to others. So basically, it's the average distance to all the others. And you can see if suppose if someone is very far away from everything else, for the average distance will be longer. So you see here that. This value varies between 1.8 and 1.3 in this case, and this r prime is basically just divided by the, the number of spins. Yeah, it's between almost one and 0.67. So if that continues to a, the a of course has a, d is it, it has long distance to all the others. It's basically further away from all the others than a. Is. The a is much closer. Others, well, not the D, of course, but others. Oh, here, here. So, R is a sum of these, and then divided by the, the number of species minus 2, which we can't see this here. And then, and you have a new distance, so you can take that. So, you can take a new distance, but basically, take the, the, the new distance between A and B is the distance you have uh, minus half of this RAB value for AB, etc. So basically, new distance, or this is not distance, this is the correct distance, so it's basically that. And then you start, in principle, I guess you could do the same thing, but here, this in this neighbor, you're an example, they start with the, what is called start volume, you basically have four, four taxes that are, you assume they are all equal distance on the road. So you have the universal route, and you say, okay, which ones should be close to each other? Uh, so you can choose uh, either A, B, or C, D, doesn't really matter. Uh, so that they choose A and B here, and no, in the road node name you So they basically start from the, the top and goes down. And you get a distance there, which is then, which is A and B doesn't have to be equal long. A is short between U and B are following this formula. And then you get a new cluster, so you have a new node U here that has a distance of B and C, that you can new distance between B and C and D. And you do the same thing again. Uh, you take a new set of these R and R prime values, and you get a new distance to uh, a new corrected distance at first. And then you take a new uh, distance to U here, and then in this case you take C, and you have a new distance to U. And you have a new node V that then puts the same thing again. Go back to you again. Uh, there's V there, and then you should get the. Uh, uh, you say the sum length to D, and then you should get the distance D, that is here, the distance is there, and then you can get the final three. Okay. Then you choose the last three. Uh, so, 
So, so basically, the, the, the idea is, is that you can correct for this kind of different evolution rate along the different uh, branches, and then you start, instead of starting from the close one, you start from the top, and you find start one pair, you get new down, which is all the, all the way down. Uh, and actually, in this case, you find an old uh, tree that fits all the, all the distances. And then there are modifications of these neighbor yoni methods that are better at uh, estimating trees and are faster, you can manage more trees, trees and so on. But uh, I thought we skipped them for today. They are in the book. They are very briefly described in the book. So the next class of methods that we're going to talk about are the ones that actually basically take a tree, so they don't use the distance. They basically have a tree, or you try all possible trees, and then you calculate how did this, given this tree, how could this sequence have evolved? So the first approach, the one we discussed most, is the maximum partial approach. That basically, given a tree, so let's assume the tree is like that, how many, and you have a starting sequence here, how many mutations must have happened for me to see this my final tree? final um, sequence distribution. So you do that for each position that you consider. So basically you calculate how many mutations. So here you have a T and there's no mutation here, but you have to replace a T with two D here. So you have one mutation there. And you have no mutation here, but you have to replace a T to an A here and a T to an A here. So you have two, two, three mutations. So that's the mo ma most parsimonious, most uh, likely, or most, uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the method has, or, or the sequence evolution has few expectations. Uh, and then you can compare this to another tree. Say what happened if you had this tree, what they said, we have more or fewer mutations. And then you try, if you have a small number of species, small number of taxa, you can try all possible trees. And then of course you have to do it for every position that you consider. So sometimes you don't include all positions, you only consider positions that are most informative. So they're positions that are different in at least two or three taxa. If they of course a position that doesn't differ at all has no information, you can ignore it. But if only different in one, maybe it's not very important, you want to have at least two or three different versions. So how do you do this? So you can think about an alignment. And here you have five species again. This time it's alphabetic gamma delta epsilon. And uh, then you have six positions that you consider. This time it's nucleotides only. You see, they are all different in at least two, two well, at least one different. Well, they are at least two that are different from the rest. Not, nothing that is only one different, so A, or this one, epsilon. They're all different, they're not, not, not all the same. So this, this one actually has. Most of them have only two positions, but this one has four hours. Uh, now they only have two. And then you take a tree, one tree, and that you can guess is a good one, and you assume that alpha delta. So you can, you can look here and say, okay, alpha and delta, maybe quite similar to you have T, A, B, T, A, T, then quite similar to T in the first position, and gamma also T, and then beta and epsilon are T in the first position, so maybe it's a good tree to have. Beat and epsilon similar, and the other three more similar to each other. But you will have to try all possible trees, or at least have some, at least go through many, many possible trees. So then you take your first position here, and you calculate the number of mutations. So you have T, T, T in alpha, gamma, delta. So these have a three T. And these have a C. So basically, you have two possible scenarios that only have one, one mutation. So either you had a C to start with, and you had a mutation here to a T, or a T to start with, and you had a mutation here to a C. Of course, you could also have a T here, and a mutation to a, uh, or an A here, and a mutation to a uh, T here and a T here. 
That was a monster. But there have been two mutations, so that would not be the most parsimonious explanation. So you try to find the one that gives fewest mutations. So in this case, this is only one. And then the next position, you have A, A, C, C, A. And here, you need to have two mutations. You need to have one here, and one here, or one there, and one there. Because alpha and delta have different positions, now A and C. So in this position, you need to have two mutations. You can keep on going through all these five characters. So the next one is still can manage with one, if you have it either here or here. Because Alpha, gamma, and delta are all the same. So basically, you need to have one mutation that separates this group from that group. And then you have uh, uh, position four and five that basically are quite are. are the same, you see the A and C, the, 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 the basic, they, they, are, they are different in the same positions so because they are identical, they are not identical, but they are, the relationship between, this, between these species are identical. So you need to have two mutation levels, either one, two like that, or one, two like that. And you can think about, because in this model you get most like the most parsimonious ancestral sequences. You can use this to reconstruct the ancestral sequence. Well, at least there are options, but it's possible ones. And then you have six, and the most likely you have C everywhere except here. So you have an A. The most parsimonious explanation for that is that you only have one point mutation here with an A. Anything else will need more, more mutations. So to sum things up, you basically need to have nine mutations. But there are, you see you also, there are some of them have two options. You can choose one, option A and B, but there's only one of them shown there. But so I think this thing is going to be here, likely there. You don't know that. The problem is, of course, that to do this, you will need to search to find the best tree. You need to search all trees, and as we said before, that a lot of trees. If you have more than five or more than ten possible ten taxa, but you can make an algorithm basically you have you start with a tree like that, and then you add one, and you basically have three options to add it. So A, B, C, I always that. When we do the searching, we don't know anything about the rules, so we basically search on under the trees. So you have ABC, ABC can only be explained in one way in the three, because they're all related to each other somehow. And then you can measure the distances, but they all, uh, uh, there's only one possible split. And, but D can then be close next to C, or next to B, or next to A. And then if we do five, you have to add E, and depending on what you add here, you can put next to each four others. So there are a lot of different trees you can uh, replace. And that's of course not possible if we have many trees. But often you do some kind of uh, search trees. You, also, you, you start here and you say, aha, if this is, looks very bad, basically the mutations are too many to fit this tree. I stop here, as a stop here. And at the end, I have to walk down one path. But you're not gar guaranteed to find optimal trees then. But it's, it certainly makes it much more realistic. Here, let's say 20 is possible, but somewhere 15, 20 is probably impossible. And the alternative for doing this kind of heuristic search method is basically you do some kind of simulations. You basically have a tree, and then you try to modify it, see if it gets better or worse, and you try to change things, and people use things like genetic algorithm or Monte Carlo simulations, etc. for that. And you can do it in a smarter way, but basically say, ah, this one, I can cut a tree here, and put it here instead, uh, and then I get another tree. I can keep on doing that, and simulate it, let the computer figure out how to do that, and have some kind of energy function that I want to optimize.
Uh, okay, so, so and um, the other method that I uh, that I mentioned in the book, you find it is much more likely method. It's, the idea is very similar to Markman partial modules, but instead of having uh, just counted number of mutations as you do here, as you do here, you actually have a model that can the model probability for a mutation to happen along this time. It's basically have a time frame moving up here. So you basically say, okay, I have a model that says that it's given a certain time that a certain mutation has to happen, has a chance to happen, and then I look what's, what's the most likely, and I can maximize that, and I can what's the most likely mutation to happen. So I can have a bit more flexibility in my model. It's not only the one with two mutations, but it also depends on the length of the branches, mutation, different mutation rates, so that we have different things happening. But it's more time consuming. But the idea is quite similar. Well, it's this is the description of the lecture. Mm. Yeah. So basically, the probability for, for a certain mutation to happen and on the branch here depends on the this parameter alpha and the time. And then you have a tree here, and you said in length of branch, and then you basically said what, what how likely is this tree with these branches and you have the ability for this mutation to happen in this position and then you just sum them up or they multiply them or they sum up the logs of the probability. And then you try to modify the tree or modify the mutation pattern and see if it's more or less likely. So it's similar but you do basically a search method. One problem, so now that, so that, no, no, we have a number of different tree methods. One problem that in particular happens in the neighboring trees is that they are also say what's called a long branch structure. So if, assume that this is the correct tree. You see that A and D branches are very long, but B is clear and more similar to C and to B than it is to A. But often when you get the tree, you end up with this, this cut here. So it's, it's common that you basically have all long branches that start from the bottom next to each other. It doesn't mean that there are, so that's a common problem you have to be aware of. The other thing, as I said, is basically you can do bootstrapping. So how do you do bootstrapping? So one, there are several different options. One is, of course, you can have some, I mean, one, one option is that in the neighbor joining, because we had different options, you can take, sometimes you have two choices, you can just take one of them randomly, and you do it many times, you get different answers. answers. Or, in, or in maximum likelihood, you can have, or take everything which has high probability, I mean, not only one, but a certain set of probabilities. Or you can use your data, you can just really take the first half of your sequence and the second half of your sequence and then make a different tree, and take a different subset of the data and use maybe only the fifth set of the data each time. But in any of these methods basically gives you the possibility to make many different trees that you have. And then you can see, so if you do 100 different trees, they are similar, but they're not identical. You see that E is sometimes there, sometimes here, sometimes that's the proposition. And then you can get some kind of consensus tree, so the most common branching points. And you see that A and B are found 100% of trees. All trees find A and B next to each other and branching here. But this branching between C and D here only found 70% of the points. So that you should be much less certain about them. It doesn't mean that E should be next to A, it means that just you maybe should have had. Uh, uh, this tree, the E should be in there instead of and C down here. So like you have to, it doesn't mean that it's hundred percent part. It's just a constant. But so this is, we basically have a split, and if you do these consensus trees. Any time you can actually often sometimes end up with, I'm um, so you get consensus numbers that are not very high, like 50 to 75. Also, what you do is that you condense these trees together, so you have like a kind of multi split. So they have like a, just a split, but you have to together. And then you make a higher, so you don't know how dog bears and raccoons are related to each other, which one is closer to each, which, but you know that they're all, uh, that C lies in C is a C closer related to them, but all these four sub subgroups. Are more are distinct from pieces. All 
Okay, so now there's some parts that are not in the book here, so basically, so far we talked about how to make a tree. And we talked about use, we use multi sequence alignment, and we use, and we sometimes actually we talk about species, sometimes we talk about genes, and uh, that's slightly confusing. So that, that you have to take one step back and think about what, what is actually happening in gene evolution. So often what we use, we use gene data, we use sequence protein data or, or DNA data when we make the trees. Of course, if you have one gene, like the 16S or ribosomal RNA that exists in one copy in every species, the gene tree and the species tree will be the same. Because they're duplicated. But it's also happening things like take um, myoglobin and hemoglobin. So he, you know hemoglobin? So hemoglobin has two chains. But they're actually, then there's actually a fetal version of it also, so you have another chain that can be there also. And then you have myoglobin, which is related, but, also, but it's certainly further away. But uh, when did myoglobin split from globin? Now, how are they doing? Or, 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 or I think there are differences between fishes and uh, mammals, I don't remember exactly, but certainly you can take all the globins to get together, and then the phycocyanins that are also related. So when do these things evolve? And, and uh, it doesn't have to be that every species has exactly one alpha and one beta chain and one myoglobin chain. It's different, different species. So if you have here a species tree, it doesn't mean that you have to have, in this case, I don't remember what gene was, but you have the human has one, two, three genes, the chicken has also three genes, the xenophos has only one, has only one gene, and Catostomus, we don't know if it's also one gene, Artemis and Hydra, and this have only one gene. Artemis and well, have two, maybe. So that means that somehow, uh, I mean, we know that human and chicken uh, the, the, are more closely related to the sophila and then to each other than to the sophila but we don't know really what uh, the three human genes which are related to one of them did they all or all the three human genes more closely related to each other so maybe it was like they defecated after the split of human and chicken or are they like here human one and chicken one are most closely related to each other so and uh, so basically, what we're asking here is when did a gene duplicate? So when did, if you have one copy in the genome, even you guys got two copies in the genome. And this is something we talk about arteriols versus paranoids. So these are commonly used names. And so basically, you know what homology means. So what does it mean? Exactly. So. The, the two genes have a common ancestor, so that's, that's the definition of homology. Then you have, have orthologs and paralogs. Like that. So orthologs are genes that are separated by a speciation event. While paralogs are genes separated by a duplication event. So if you have so basically, if you have one species, and then for some reason a chromosome or part of the chromosome duplicates, and you get two copies of the same gene, then these two genes are parallel. So it has happened, for instance, in many organisms, particularly in many trees or, or, or plants, that you have a whole gene of duplications. Even yeast, you added twice within the last about 200 million years. So you have basically the whole genome of duplicated. And there are a lot of theories. Why it's good, I mean, but, but it also is duplication of single genes that don't happen because you have basically you get part of the chromosome that get ended up and you have and, and, and got copied, copied again. So there are many more, there are a lot of these large scale mutation things that happen to species that are not just mutations. And the idea is at least that if you have two copies of a gene, and there are, it's that one of them could be free to evolve, to, evolve, to create a new function. It's hard to prove, but, but it, could, it could be really, it's, I mean, if you have a gene doing a specific function, and you need, have a need for some other function, it could be difficult for that gene to evolve to do that, because you lose the first function. 
And if you have two copies of it, you might have one and you don't have any strong safety pressure on it. At least that's a model. It's a bit hard to prove evolutionarily that it really happens like that, but you try, right, what is the function, etc. So it, but it, at least it, there are some indications that it actually is occurring like that. It, it might be more likely that you actually have sort of sub functionalization. So if you have two copies of a gene doing the same thing, they start doing like I mean, the same thing still, but uh, specialized in different types of cell types or different types of uh, uh, parts of the cell cycle or doing some slightly variation of things. Of course, you also have a problem if you have two copies of a gene, you might have bad problems of, of uh, having too many copies of it because you need to regulate the dust. There are other problems, but it, at least the idea, at least it's clear that duplication happens often and it might be a way for an organism to get new functions of a gene. So, uh, we have homologs, it's basically everything that's homologous, so that's anything that has a common ancestor. Autologs are similar sequences in two different organs that have a reasonable split A mate. So basically, the same gene that my, my hemoglobin A gene is in hemoglobin A, a, a gene in, in uh, uh, chimpanzees are, are homologs, or autologs. But paralogs are, for instance, my hemoglobin, hemoglobin A and my hemoglobin B gene. They are they are related by specific, by duplication event sometime back in history. So you can look at it like that. You have a gene A that sometimes still get duplicated. So you have a two alpha, and then they start mutating. So they start doing something different times. You call them one alpha, one alpha, one beta. They are somehow they're different, and then you have. In one species, they keep on existing that. In other species, the beta, then alpha duplicate again and become a gamma. Then you have three, three here. And then also, the common thing is actually genes get lost. So you might lose this alpha here, and then, or this beta here, and then you don't have it at all. So, the, so to, to try to figure this out all the way back is quite complicated, but there are models that try to do it. But it's, I mean, it's not common duplication, it also happens that you lose genes. So in this case, the tree would look like the uh, so the tree would look like that. So the, uh, the alpha and the gamma of the B species are more similar to the alpha of the A species than they are to the B of the beta of the B species. Basically, you see this one. This was the recent application happening here. So they are they only exist in B. And then, of course, the closest thing to this thing is basically the alpha up here. That is this alpha here. So if you, but then, so if you, so this the, spe, the gene tree will look like that. But of course, this is not a species tree because this is these two are the same species and these are not. They are. If you, if you just have some samples, if you have, I don't know, two species, but if you have a subset of these samples, you would have to get a wrong idea of the species tree because the identification happened. Yeah, so here you have the globins, you have the identification, you have the alpha chain and B chain. Four chicken mouse have, have all the alpha and beta, and they all have a beta. These genes here are called orthologs, and these genes, well, the this is the alpha and the beta are called paralogs, these are orthologs. But everything is called homologs. Uh, then, of course, if you really want to find the evolution of everything, it's not as easy. Of course, there are the concept of species, means that you basically should have the same genome as you evolved, but in particular in bacteria. And like here, there's a lot of horizontal gene transfer. It means that genes jump between split organisms. I mean, the most crucial cases are, of course, all the uh, antibiotic resistance genes that are often of plasmid, but sometimes they're also transferred, transferred between species. Also. There are maybe some horizontal transfer happening to eukaryotes, but it can be a bit debated. 
Uh, well, obviously, you can say that the HIV virus is such in the human uh, in your group, but it doesn't get well. So far, we don't know if it doesn't get stuck in the population because it's not in the in the in the sex cells, so it's only in the body, so it's not there. But there are there are also evidence of uh, other virus sequences that are stuck in our genome. But how old are we? Don't know. But, so, but, but, in particular, but in all the prokaryotes, both in Archaea and Bacteria, there's a lot of transfer. So it's very hard to define species section in Bacteria because there's a lot of changes. And we should also remember that all similarities. So sometimes people say that uh, homology means that some but that some proteins are similar means that they're homologous. But that's not always the case. You can visit take. I think it's a theory in uh, protease, so there's at least one active site or something. And if you look at the active site here, they look very similar. You agree? But if you look at the protein itself, try to suppose them, they're completely different, unrelated. So if you, if you try to trace things back in history, very, very, very long back, it's Hard, I mean, nobody will argue these two proteins are related. So they're completely different folds, completely related. But actually, do, they do the same function. They do the same catalysis. The, the catalytic mechanism is the same. But it doesn't ha happen to occur twice in this case. Well, at least twice. So it's not obvious that all similarities are homology. There are a number of cases that you have thin barrels, for instance, that are alpha beta proteins that are very regular. And uh, you have. Uh, they do very, very, very different functions. They have any type of enzyme you can think about, they can do. But it can be debated how if they all have common answers or not, if they occur many times. It's possible, I mean, people, some people have different opinions. There's also <coughs> ideas that it's, there are internal symmetries in these, so the common answers might have been just uh, one quarter of this uh, thin virus, the, the asymmetric. And then there was, so that was updated, but nobody really knows. That's not how it looks like today. That was, I think, my last slide. So you learned something? You're eager to go to the dinosaur lab. Do you have a lab tomorrow or today? Tomorrow. Oh, and today. And today. Starting at 3. Oh. Late lab. Okay. So. No more questions, I'll see you on Wednesday.